Okay, so I hear people talking about the demand estimation. Um, I'll be interested to see what you came up with. I'm going to give you feedback as quick as I can so that hopefully you'll be able to incorporate that feedback into phase two, which is where you're doing the pipe sizing. But the good news is once you have kind of the layout of your pipes set up in water gems, even if you continue to tinker around with your demand estimates, it's not going to add that much extra work. So you can kind of in parallel make fine tuning and correction to your demand estimation at the same time as you're laying out the pipe network and kind of honing in on the optimal size. Um, we're going to do another water gems example in class on Wednesday. So please bring your computer along with water gems. It's going to be the last time I give you instruction on how to use that program before uh, you're moving on to phase two, which is where you're kind of using it in earnest to um, identify the best pipe size for the network. So bring your laptop Wednesday. Um, looking a little bit further into the future, homework eight is due on Friday of this week, one o'clock. And then after spring break, you'll have homework nine due. And then the next phase of the design project is due on Friday the 24th. So March is going to be busy, but it's going to be a good kind of busy where you're learning a lot, getting stronger as designers, hopefully picking up skills that will make you more useful as an engineer, software packages that you can put on your resume, something worth talking about in, a, in an interview. So I hope it's a good kind of busy. Uh, any question on the announcements? All right. So we're moving from chapter 11, which was where we were talking about Manning's equation and steady uniform flow and how we find the flow depth when conditions are steady and uniform using Manning's equation. Now in chapter 12, we're going to start picking up tools that allows us to predict what's the depth of flow when conditions aren't steady and uniform, which is to say most of the time. So this is pretty important stuff here in chapter 12. If you're not in the habit yet of reading along in the book, I'd encourage you to, uh, to consider it because I think you'd get some value. Our book isn't too verbose. Um, you know, I think they hit the, the most important points in a pretty efficient way. And so it would be worth kind of reviewing the topics that are identified for each class and kind of just see how the author explains things. Uh, one last announcement about the Career Expo. That's going to be on, I guess I'll announce it on Wednesday too. But um, remember it's recommended that you try and dress profession professionally for that. Uh, take several copies of your resume over to the uh, Career Expo. And if you want to uh, bounce your resume off me, I'd be happy to look at it and tell you what I think. There are people at the Office of Career Education who can do the same thing. You can make an appointment with them on Handshake. And they can give you advice on like your LinkedIn profile and your resume and that sort of thing. So I think it's really good for you to be, getting, uh, to be uh, thinking regularly about what you want to do after you're done at Marshall and uh, the kind of career you want to have, the kind of workplace that you're going to be in. So the Career Expo is a great event for all of that. All right. Now, um, we've talked about the energy equation and how it's different um, in open channel flow than it is in closed conduit flow. And when we had water flowing through pipes, remember how the energy equation had a pressure head term, an elevation head term, and a velocity head term? Those were the three places that the water energy could be in closed conduit flow. In open channel flow, the energy is in the depth, the elevation above a datum, and the velocity head. Now, this is the total energy, where we're keeping track of the energy above some uh, standardized datum. In chapter 12, we're now going to be talking about specific energy, which is how much energy is in the water using the channel bed as our starting point. So we're eliminating any calculations of delta Z when we talk about specific energy. So specific energy, the energy per unit weight of the fluid relative to the channel bottom. So you'll notice here there's no Z term, in other words. The velocity head, of course, can be expressed in terms of Q squared divided by 2GA squared. And the utility of that 
is simply that oftentimes the unknown is the depth. And it's not convenient for us to express velocity in terms of an unknown depth, but flow rate and area sometimes can be more easily expressed in terms of an unknown depth because oftentimes we'll have a flow rate. We'll say that there's you know, 10 cubic meters per second going through a channel, so Q is given, and we'll know the width of the channel, and so one of the components of A is known, but then the unknown would be the depth Y. And so in situations like that, we've got this Y term and then another Y term in the velocity head, and so our only unknown would be the depth that we're trying to be solving for. So this substitution of using Q squared divided by 2G A squared, we'll see a lot more of that here when we're talking about specific energy. Now, um, let's consider a rectangular channel which is four meters wide. And we like rectangular channels obviously because it's relatively simple for us to calculate the area. It's just depth times width. Whereas if it was trapezoidal, the top width is constantly changing as the depth is changing. So just for this example, let's say that we've got a four meter wide channel and it's, it's carrying 10 cubic meters per second, but we have the ability to change the slope of this channel. So we could, if we wanted, make the slope very steep or we could make the slope very shallow. And what that's going to do is it's going to adjust the flow depth for the same flow rate Q and for a constant width of the channel. And of course, the roughness won't change if we increase or decrease the slope of the channel. The only thing that's increasing and decreasing is the slope. And from that, what we'd see is different depths. And so we could construct a table that has a lot of different velocities. And so 10 meters per second, obviously a really fast velocity would have to be because this is a pretty steep channel or the, at the end of the extreme, we could have a relatively mild slope where the water is only going one meter per second, which actually is still pretty fast, but we're just going to look at different velocities across this range from 10 to 1. And so they all have the same flow rate. And if we know that the flow rate is velocity times area, so for this table, if we all have 10 cubic meters per second is the flow rate for each row, but different velocities, then of course the area will be small when we have the high velocity. And so, for example, you'd have to have an area of one square meter with flow going 10 meters per second to get a flow rate of 10 cubic meters per second. But then here at the other extreme, what's the area if the velocity is one? Well, it would have to be an area of 10 square meters. Okay, so, so far so good, I hope, for these first three columns. Now, this column, the fourth one, is just saying we'd have a variety of different depths to achieve the given flow rate and velocity and area. So what would the depth be if you have a four meter wide channel and the area has to be one so that tells us, for example, that the depth here in this first row would be 0.25 meters. And so if we look at half the velocity, it would be twice the depth. Because there's a linear relationship between the depth and the area. And of course, it's the area times the velocity that gives us the flow rate. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a lot of different ways to have the same flow rate can be shallow slopes that give you a low velocity. It can be steep slopes that give you a high velocity. And they're all going to have different energies associated with them as well. So E, specific energy, is the depth and the velocity head. And by the way, who remembers what alpha is? Do you remember that from fluid mechanics, alpha? I had somebody ask me about it much earlier in the semester. So I know at least one person. It was me, but I forget what he said. It was a long time ago. I'm sorry. You knew it once, though, and I'm still impressed. Okay. All right. Alpha is the kinetic energy correction factor. And so when you have turbulent conditions, which is most of the time, then alpha is so close to one that we don't generally even bother keeping track of alpha. But if you have laminar conditions, the kinetic energy correction factor is two. And so it just is a, a factor that adjusts 
<coughs> how much energy there is as a function of the flow velocity. So most of the time, I'm not going to bother writing alpha, but just to reiterate something that I think you probably learned in fluid mechanics, it's a kinetic energy correction factor. But, okay, so E is just the depth. So for this first row, for example, it would be 0 0.250. So that's the depth component of the energy. And then squaring the flow rate divided by 2G A squared. Okay, so we could calculate some specific energy for a given depth velocity combination. So if you look at this table, then the energy is high when we've got a really large velocity. So look at this, 5.3 meters of energy. How much of that energy is from the depth? Well, only 0.25 meters. So where is most of the energy coming from when you've got this low depth of 0.25 meters? Most of the energy is because the kinetic energy component is really high. If you look at 10 meters per second in a really low cross-sectional area, you're getting a lot of velocity head, more than 5 meters of velocity head. So the specific energy is decreasing gradually and then it'll come to a point where it reaches a minimum. And then the specific energy starts increasing again. And now look at this bottom row. If the top row was mostly velocity head contributing to the specific energy, where is most of the energy coming from in the bottom row? It's mostly the depth. If you look, the total energy is 2.551 meters. So there's 2.551 meters of total energy, well, specific energy. And of that 2.551 meters, 2.5 of it is depth. And so that means only 0 0.051 meters of head is coming from the velocity head. So there's this transition where at one end of the extreme, you're having a lot of velocity head and very little depth. At the other end of the extreme, you can have lots of depth, but then when you do, there isn't very much energy existing in the velocity head term. Okay, now you'll notice that I did something strange here with one of my depths. It's an odd number here. For the rest of the depths, it was just corresponding to some uh, velocity that was a, like kind of a nice round number, but this was the depth that corresponds to the lowest specific energy. So if we minimize specific energy, the question is, what is the depth that causes that? And it's something that we could do with solver. Um, we looked at solver, I think, last week, where it's a little bit more advanced than goal seek, where with goal seek, you have to have an objective, and you tell it it can play around with a cell subject to knowing what the objective is you're trying to hit. With solver, you can say minimize it. And so it will just play with lots of different depths y until it reaches the lowest specific energy. And so if we set up solver and we said there's a channel that's 4 meters wide, it has a flow rate of 10 cubic meters per second, find the y that minimizes e. It would come up in this case with 0.861 meters of depth. Now it's not always 0.861, it's not like that's a magical depth out there in the world. That's just for this particular combination of 10 cubic meters per second in a four meter wide rectangular channel. But there is something notable about this depth. It's called the critical depth. And so it is the depth that has the minimum specific energy. So here's a graph that you could create that has on one axis the depth of flow, on another axis the flow velocity. So this is a pretty basic trend, not much interpretation we can do with this figure other than say when you have a low depth you've got high velocity when you've got high flow depth you've got low velocity everywhere on this curve though has the same flow rate 10 cubic meters per second okay this this curves boring but if we were going to graph the specific <coughs> energy that's a very useful and interesting curve that we can do a lot of analysis with so this curve 
is very important. And you'll make this on Excel, I think, at one point in the homework. And what you'll be graphing is, on one axis, the depth of flow, and on another axis, specific energy. So how would you make a graph like this? Well, you just generate a table like that. You'd have a variety of different flow rates, well, the same flow rate in different rows, and you'd have a variety of different depths, and for those depths, what would be the velocity in the area? So you could calculate specific energy with respect to the depth associated with that specific energy. So why is this curve so important? What it shows us is that minimum point. So this location where you've got the least amount of specific energy is the critical depth. So you can create a curve for this for any flow, uh, any flow rate and any channel. It doesn't have to be 4 meters wide. It doesn't have to be 10 cubic meters per second. You could make a figure like this even for a trapezoidal channel. And if I remember correctly, that's what you'll be doing on the homework assignment is you'll be making a specific energy diagram. Sometimes these are abbreviated SED, specific energy diagram. And so the point that's furthest to the left on the specific energy diagram, the minimum specific energy is the critical depth. So like what is significant about the minimum specific energy? Think about what it means. Everywhere on this curve is carrying the same flow rate. This is all 10 cubic meters per second. So what you can think of this point that's farthest to the left is it's where you're getting the most bang for your buck, in essence, because you're conveying 10 cubic meters per second with the least amount of energy required. And so out in the real world, when water pools, meaning when there's some sort of an obstacle, like if you uh, went over to Ritter Park and you started throwing like logs and rocks into Four Pole Creek, the water would have to rise until it flows over those obstacles. Like if you just threw a bunch of junk in there, the water level would pool and then it would stop rising and it would flow over the obstacle. So like why does it stop rising at a certain point? The water level rises until it reaches the critical depth. And that is because it's the critical depth is the one that conveys the required flow with the least amount of specific energy. So the water level would rise only until there's enough energy in the system to overcome the obstacle. So critical flow is, um, I guess you could say critical, not to use a pun, but it's really important because uh, it allows us to understand how the water flowing through a channel is going to react when there are things like uh, the channel getting narrower. Um, so that's one, one kind of a choke, is a channel getting narrower. Or as I've already mentioned, if we have an obstacle, or like if water's having to flow up over a ledge of some sort. And even the critical energy can be important when water's flowing down over a step. So critical depth is associated with the minimum specific energy. So you can think this is the most efficient flow condition because you're conveying the flow of 10 cubic meters per second, in this case, with the least amount of specific energy. So what actually, what, what depth would the water be at in a given situation? You know, it, we are going to go into the hydraulics lab probably next week, maybe on Friday, I don't know. We're going to go into the hydraulics lab and we're going to use the flume. You've probably seen the flume in the back of the hydraulics lab. It's that long rectangular channel and we're going to turn on the pump and it's going to send water to the top of the flume and we can adjust the slope of the flume. And so we could make the flow depth effectively anything we want. We can make it a deep flow depth by having a shallow slope or we can crank up the head end of that flume and make it steeper and that will adjust the, the, uh, the flow depth. And so all of the factors in a channel, including the geometry, the material it's made out of, and the corresponding roughness, all of those factors contribute to the flow depth, but it's the slope that kind of is the most important variable that sometimes we can control, sometimes we can't. But that's what determines, like in the case of this chart, where we had multiple different depths, the one thing that would have to change to make these different depths possible in a four meter wide channel would be the slope. Okay, 
So any questions so far about specific energy? Okay, now there's something else that's really important about the specific <coughs> energy diagram. Uh, it identifies what are known as alternate depths, two depths that have the same specific energy. Okay, so if you look, for instance, um, on this table, if we go back to the table, there is one depth, let's see, where are some that are pretty close? Here's 2.55, and between, you can see, between a depth of 3.57 and 0.42, there's another place that the specific energy would be about 2.5. So there's two different locations with different depths that have the same specific energy. So if we went up from two, so if you can have two meters of specific energy either by having in this, this lower depth is associated with supercritical flow and this upper depth is associated with subcritical flow. Do you remember when I told you about flow regime? I think it was in the video, flow regime, where you're calculating the Froud number and the Froud number of greater than one is supercritical flow. Froud number of less than one is subcritical flow. Here's another way that you can determine whether conditions are super or subcritical is by looking at the flow depth and comparing it to the critical depth. So if your water is flowing at a depth of more than 0.86 meters in this particular example, that would be subcritical flow. And I know that's a little counterintuitive because the depth is deeper than the critical depth. But what makes it subcritical is with a deep depth, you have a relatively slow velocity. So supercritical is when you have a fast moving velocity. So which would be the depth of you know, the two options that you get when you go upward from two meters, it crosses this figure at a low point and it crosses the figure at a high point. So at the high point, it's got big depth but low velocity. That's subcritical. At this lower crossing point, we go over to the side, it's got a low flow depth but a high velocity. So that's supercritical. So we can use these specific energy diagrams to diagnose whether the flow regime is supercritical or subcritical. And we can also use them to identify alternate depths. And um, I guess it's the alternate depths that may be the most important part of specific energy. Because when you have, let me just draw a channel from a top view. If you've got, you know, a river flowing along and suddenly the channel gets wider, you had some depth at one. Uh, this is a top view, by the way. Okay, so at location one, before the channel expanded, there's some depth. And at two, there's going to be a new depth. So the question is, if, if you have a certain flow rate, it's the same flow rate in and out. So Q hasn't changed. It's just that the channel got wider. And so we want to know, what is going to be the new depth when the channel expands? Well, specific energy analysis allows us to determine that. And so we're going to use these specific energy diagrams to help us identify what will be the new flow depth in a situation where the channel gets wider, where the channel gets narrower, or, let me just erase this and now show you a side view, if the water is flowing along, here's our side view, this is the bottom of the channel, we've got a flow depth and conditions are steady and uniform, but then suddenly there's some sort of an irregularity. So what happens? Does the water get shallower as it flows over that obstacle? Does the water get deeper after it goes over that obstacle? It could actually go either way, depending on whether conditions upstream were supercritical or subcritical. So we're going to have to really be pretty careful in these calculations. We can't just use intuition to tell us whether or how the water is going to react in 
when it's encountering obstacles in the flow path. Okay, so any questions about a specific energy diagram? I think that probably right now you could make a specific energy diagram because you've seen the table where all you're doing is just for a certain flow rate, Q, you're just choosing a bunch of different velocities. And how do you know which velocities to choose? Well, it's a little bit iterative because what you're going to need is you're going to need to have a figure that shows this, this point that's all the way out to the left. So like if you created this table and you only had the velocity from 10 to 3, then you wouldn't have found that left edge of the specific energy diagram. And so you need to just pick, pick a range of velocities and enough of them so that you get a good curve out of it. Okay, well let's talk more about critical flow. Uh, these rules need to become secondhand to you. You need to just instinctively and immediately know um, how to diagnose the flow regime. <coughs> so we've talked about critical depth, and what that means is it's the depth with the least specific energy. Anytime the flow depth is more than the critical depth, then that means you've got subcritical conditions. And it's called sub because you've got slow water velocity. And so therefore the opposite would be supercritical conditions when the flow depth is greater than, excuse me, supercritical conditions is when the flow depth is less than critical depth. And so that's going to be relatively fast moving water velocity. And um, we can also sometimes, in, depending on uh, which version of the Froude number formula we're using, we may need to know the, uh, the width of the channel when conditions are critical. Um, now, if it's a rectangular channel, it doesn't change at all. You know, like if you've got a rectangular channel, then the flow width is always the same regardless of what is uh, the depth, right? So that's not a big problem. But if you have a trapezoidal channel, y sub c is going to be some depth. And so b sub c is just what is the top width when you have y, when you've got the critical depth of flow. So there's a, a version of the Froude number equation that we'll use for trapezoidal channels that uh, uses the top width when you have critical conditions as one of its parameters. Okay, so here's that rectangular channel, but remember when you've got a trapezoidal channel, the top width depends on the side slope angle. So we have one unit of vertical and T units of horizontal. So for a given depth, we could calculate how wide is the top. So here is the Froude number equation where um, in this first term, the D that they're referring to is the hydraulic depth, which, remember, is the cross-sectional area divided by the top width. And probably easier than expressing the Froude number in terms of velocity is expressing it in terms of flow rate. So if you're trying to find out what is the critical depth, so Froude number of 1 is critical. So if they said, I want to find out what is the critical depth, then you'd set 1 equal to Q squared B sub C divided by G A cubed. And you'd need to express the area and the top width in terms of Y and solve for the unknown Y. So we'll do that in an example. But I just want to kind of point you towards where we're headed with this, um, this definition of the Froude number. So if you're trying to diagnose the flow regime, then you would find the Froude number. So anytime the Froude number is less than 1 is subcritical conditions, greater than 1 is supercritical. But then if you know that you want to find the critical depth, you just set the Froude number equal to 1, and then... Um, 
solve for the y, which will be in both area and the top width term. Less than frown number, frown number less than one is subcritical, greater than one supercritical. All right. Supercritical flow is really important um, in, in hydraulics because it's a way of, when you have supercritical flow, you've got a lot of energy that has to be dissipated. And so uh, dam designers in particular, are, they'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out how they're going to dissipate energy as water is going over the spillway of a dam. Because you know energy that is in that water has a lot of scour potential, it can do damage. You maybe remember the pictures that we looked at uh, of the Oroville Dam in California and how that spillway got all cracked up and the scour and the erosion that they had. Um, so supercritical flow is something that has to be uh, dealt with very carefully and they'll put in a lot of really interesting measures to try and uh, dissipate the energy and take the flow back down to subcritical where it's going to be less dangerous to the channel that receives it. Okay, so just to come back to the idea of hydraulic depth, uh, hydraulic depth is the cross-sectional area of flow divided by the top width. Um, so we've got this formula for Froude number. There are simpler equations for Froude number that are only true if you've got a rectangular channel. And one of the mistakes that unfortunately I see a lot on exams is this version of the Froude number formula is always true, regardless of whether it's rectangular, trapezoidal. This formula will never lead you astray. But there are other formulas that are simpler, but they only apply if it's a rectangular channel. So you have to be careful about which Froude number equation you're using. And I'll, I'll try and emphasize that a, a few times in the coming classes just to distinguish between this one which is always universally applicable, whether it's rectangular, triangular, circular, whatever the shape is, this version of the Froude number equation is, is going to be fine. Um, so the hydraulic depth of a rectangular channel like this is just simply equal to its depth. And um, if you've got a very wide channel, then that's when the, the, then the hydraulic depth is, uh, is equal to y because the effect of the, uh, the side is relatively minor compared to the, um, the wetted perimeter across the bottom. So very wide is kind of a technical term in open channel flow. And what we mean by very wide is that the width is greater than or equal to 20 times the depth. Um, so you know, here's a very wide channel. And I think what you could see is that if, if it's very wide, then the bottom distance of the channel is so much greater than the side slopes that we effectively don't have to keep track of them. But um, let's do some calculations here just to get some practice using the Froude number equation. Um, we've got a rectangular channel here, the same four meter width, and we're going to use the same 10 cubic meters per second. And so here is the specific energy diagram. You should be able to diagnose whether the flow is supercritical or subcritical just by using the specific energy diagram. You shouldn't need to do any calculations to determine whether the flow is supercritical or subcritical. Okay, so how would you do that? You'd first, you'd look to see what is the critical depth. And so the critical depth is the one that has the least specific energy. So here it is on, this, on the figure. And if you go over to the left side, and it looks like the depth of flow associated with the minimum specific energy, 0.86. Okay, so for a depth Y less than the critical depth, that is supercritical flow. Now, what about the depth of 1.25? Okay, well, that's just greater than the critical depth, and so that's going to be in the subcritical range. We could actually draw a little line on this figure. We could draw a line and say everything below that critical depth is, this is the supercritical region, and everything above it is the subcritical region. All right. 
So we kind of just qualitatively diagnosed the flow regime by comparing the given depth to the specific energy diagram. Now, calculate the Froude number and see if it, if it agrees. You know, do you have a Froude number greater than one for this first one, less than <coughs> one for the other? All right, so the, the first depth, which was 0.25 meters, has a Froude number of greater than one. So that kind of confirms the same conclusion that we'd come to just by using the specific energy diagram. You know, by noticing that the depth of 0.25 meters is below the critical depth, that tells us it's supercritical flow. And then also the Froude number confirms it. Froude number is greater than, greater than one. And then for the depth of 1.25, that was a depth which is greater than the critical depth of 0.86. And so that leads us to conclude subcritical flow conditions, and it's confirmed with the Froude number, less than one subcritical flow. All right, any questions about that illustration? Okay, alternate depths. So here's our specific energy diagram. Remember that it's for a flow rate of 10 cubic meters per second, channel width of 4 meters. And specific energy is the combination of depth and velocity head. And we can either express velocity head in terms of V or in terms of the flow rate and the cross-sectional area. So when you've got 0.5 meters of of depth, if we go over and find a certain location on the chart, we can find out how much specific energy there is. And I guess we'd need to zoom in a little bit, or maybe even better, is uh, I might have a spreadsheet that has this example on it. Let me look and see. I think I've got the specific energy diagram. Well, we can make one pretty easily, and we've got the time to do it. Let me just grab the data here. So if you need to create a specific energy diagram, what you're looking for is combinations of flow rate that give you I uh, didn't paste very good. All right, we're going to look for different flow rates, Q, cubic meters per second, depth, area, velocity, and then energy. And remember that these all have 10 cubic meters per second as the flow rate. And um, so the depth could range from maybe like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. I'll do it through maybe 2.8. 
and it's going to have all of the same flow rates and the area is going to be the uh, for this four meter wide channel it would just it would be um, four times the depth and remember that the velocity is the flow rate divided by the area and then the specific energy is the depth plus now we can either do it q squared divided by 2g a squared or we can be v squared divided by 2g since i've got the velocity i'll just do it in terms of the velocity so plus velocity squared divided by 2 times 9.81 okay so we've got the specific energy for each of these now this is asking in this last illustration let's find for a depth of 0.5 what is the alternate depth okay so here's our depth of 0.5 and it has an energy of 1.774 okay so if we're trying to find the alternate depth the question is What is the depth that has the same specific energy? Uh, so what is the depth like besides 0 0.5 meters that has the same specific energy of 1.77421? All right, so we can look down here through it. OK, this is pretty close, 1.72. 1.81 so it's going to be between 1.6 and 1.7 so now we can do our automated tools of goal seek so we want to have this be equal to 1.77421 by changing the depth okay and if we let it go it tells us 1.66 has the uh, same specific energy. So let me just bold these so that we can have these alternate depths. And so what we looked for is the alternate depth for y equals 0 0.5 is 1.66 meters. All right, now the last thing let's try to do is identify the uh, the minimum point so if we want to have the minimum specific energy we can use solver for that so solver we want this specific energy to be minimized by changing the depth and have it solve and it'll change Okay, it found the 0.86. So we could then, as a final thing, if, if this was creating a specific energy diagram, what you would have is on the horizontal axis, specific energy. On the vertical axis, you'd have the depth. But uh, that shows us how we can use Excel to find the specific energy. Now, water could go through a transition and be either of those two depths there may be energy losses as it goes through the transition. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not desirable. We'll talk more about it in a future class. You've got a lot going on, so remember that on Wednesday, please bring your laptop with water gems installed. And then homework eight is due on Friday.